Thank you very much, Julie. So we all know that Zoom is an attempt to melt away space and time and so people can be from any time and any, any space. But it's important for me to orient myself. I'm in Yerushalayim. When I look out my window, I can see the Dead Sea and across the Dead Sea, the lights on the mountains of Jordan. And literally across the street from my house is the U.S. Embassy. Uh, I don't know who the new, uh, the new ambassador is going to be, but I'm happy to have a, a new neighbor uh, next to our house. It's also the biggest flag I have, American flag I have ever seen in my whole life across the street. Now, exactly in that location, in the neighborhood called Talpiot, where I'm now located, in 1948, that's uh, almost uh, 73 years ago, and my father and my mother, uh, my father's a conservative rabbi, my, and he and my mother came to Israel in November of 1947. Immediately after that was the recognition, was the plan for a partition of the Palestine mandate into a Jewish and Arab area. My parents then ended up joining the Haganah, which was the illegal underground. And that's also when the civil war broke out with the rejection by the local Arabs of a partition plan. And so my father found himself in April 1948, uh, along with a bunch of soldiers in the neighborhood of Telpiot, and he volunteered to organize their Seder for them. He wasn't a, a chaplain, he was just a regular soldier along with them. And um, after my father passed away, we actually found the original Haggadah, a little paper Haggadah that he used when he prepared that Seder for the soldiers. And as a good educator, he wrote down many principles by which he was going to guide that Seder. So I'll just mention three of them that are particularly unique. Uh, the first one was, he said, the, uh, the official leader of the Seder will be Shmuel Yosef Agnon, who later is the first winner of a Nobel Prize of, for Israel, a Nobel Prize for Literature. He was a next door neighbor across the street from the, uh, the, little, uh, the little hotel where the Seder was being held, which is now the embassy location. And he wrote the following things. He said, number one, he said, please don't finish all the wine after the first cup, right? He's talking to a bunch of soldiers. Afterwards, my father said, Gornish Helfen, it didn't help at all. The soldiers finished all the wine after the first cup. The second thing he said, everybody from all different groups from Morocco and from Hungary and from Germany, they should all sing the parts of the Seder according to their family traditions. That was a, a reflection of my father's deep sense of multiculturalism, his joy at the diversity of different Jews. Also, it was a practical matter because my father is tone deaf and he certainly didn't want to sing when leading the Seder. And the third thing he wrote down was, anyone who steals the Afikoman will be court-martialed. So I think there's a couple of principles you can learn already from my father's early Haggadah about running a Haggadah. The first one having to do with the wine, you better have enough wine, enough food in general. Food is a very essential part of planning a Seder in case you never knew that, of course, right? The second thing is you have to maximize the participation of different kinds of people by appealing to their background, their talents, and their desire to be part of the experience, knowing that Seders, at least in a traditional period, not during Corona, involved an enormous variety of people in all kinds of relatives who have varying attitudes toward Judaism, including many who aren't Jewish, and people of multiple different ages and different experiences. And so the way you can get multiple kinds of people to participate in the Seder, rather than resenting it or feeling that it's forced on them, is essential. The third principle, having a sense of humor. One of the handouts that, uh, that Julie put up in the list of handouts is a bunch of cartoons, some of my favorite cartoons from The New Yorker that are related directly to the Exodus. And having that sense of humor is an important part of a Seder, that playfulness. But there's a fourth principle which my father didn't even have to write down. And that is the relevance of your Seder to what's happening historically at that moment. So my father, it's of course, the possibility that there might be a Jewish state but also the possibility that there might be a massacre by the Arab armies that are about to enter the land of Israel in May 15th, and he's having the Seder at the end of April. It's only three years, of course, after, from the end of the Holocaust. And therefore, the sense that this is the Exodus 
that there's the danger of genocide, but that there's a possibility of coming to the promised land, all of those made it an extremely sense of relevance in which they are participating in making history and completing the promise, the promise at the end of the Haggadah next year in Jerusalem. Um, now, I'm, what we're going to be doing during this first session is, I'd like to talk with you about, um, about the Corona Seder, and I'll talk about three aspects, I think, of the Corona experience, the COVID-19 experience, and how that might be emphasized and come to play a role in the way you plan your Seder. We'll be using a Corona Seder guide that I produced. Then we're going to take a look at, go back to looking at some of the history, see the history of the way the Haggadah has developed, more or less five stages in the development of the Seder, and particularly focus on the Rabbinic Seder from 2,000 years ago, because that's really the Seder, the Rabbinic Seder created after the Temple was destroyed, that really sets the pattern for all of the Seders that we have ever since. Um, and then next time when we get together, we're going to be taking a look at some more of the practical issues, some of the, what I call the five obstacles to having a good participatory Seder. And we're going to be taking a look at all kinds of different resources and also walking through some of the key elements in the Haggadah. I'm going to be using in particular the Night to Remember Haggadah that I did with my son, uh, which is the second Haggadah I did and has a very strong emphasis on contemporary interpretations, both American Jewish and, uh, and Israeli contemporary interpretations of the Haggadah. And of course, we'll be open to questions and answers all the way through. Okay, so let's start with the coronavirus. Um, and let me start by suggesting uh, there's at least three different things that I think the coronavirus does to the way we celebrate seders. And the first one has to do with this. I hope you can see this, All right? You may wonder what it is. It's not bud juice. But my wife, she took 10 bottles, filled each bottle with something symbolizing a plague, like a lot of plastic frogs in one of them. And this, of course, is the blood from the first of the, uh, of the plagues. Now, I would imagine that many of you are like me that in 2019, before Corona, plagues was something fun. It was something to play with, right? It was so long ago that really empathizing with the, the suffering of the Egyptians is not a central figure. Many of us have plague bags with ping pong balls for, uh, for hail or plastic frogs and things like that. Um, but for us, plague wasn't a real thing. And now I think we have to treat the plague in a very different way and be very sensitive to what the issues are that are involved with that plague. Um, and therefore, the first thing I would think about about the Seder in light of the corona is to go back to the very first Seder, that is, wasn't called the Seder, but the very first Passover celebration in the Bible, and to see that that was the first corona Seder. It was a Seder in the midst of a plague. And perhaps a nice way to add to your Haggadot is to start your Seder with going through part of the chapter in Exodus 12, which talks about what, what plague meant then, and then invite people to say what's similar, what's different. And that might be a good way to give us some historical context. So I'm going to start sharing with you the, uh, the Corona Seder that I put together. Okay, how come it's not here? Mm, this is not good. Okay, that's never happened to me before. Let's try it one more time and see if it'll work this time. Here's the Seder. Okay, much better. Okay, Seder in time of the plague. So, this is a picture of some of the Haggadot that, I, that we've produced and that you now have... Uh, you now have PDFs of those Haggadot for your own preparations. And now this is the beginning of my uh, guidance. So I'm gonna go to um, the section that describes that plague. Here we go, okay? Exodus 12, okay? Moses' public safety announcements for the first Passover. I don't know about you, but in many ways I have been living by the constant uh, announcements coming from the Israeli government about who can, whether you can be out 
whether it's a lockdown, till what distance you can go, all kinds of, of uh, public safety announcements, many of them confusing, many of them illogical, many of them that people ignore completely, even if they should or shouldn't do it. But the whole notion that suddenly you have a central authority that's preparing you for a very dangerous health situation, that begins here. And of course, I don't know whether how many of you stockpiled toilet paper, or in the case in Israel, there was a big shortage of eggs before Passover a year ago, leading many Israelis to go to the Arab sector to buy eggs because they knew that the Arabs wouldn't be ma making, cooking as many eggs as the Jews were going to do for the Seder. And so here, Moses says, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, this month is for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. Now, if any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with each person's eating process. So the concern for how you get your foods, right here we have an example of a, a lamb. It actually uh, is a pregnant lamb, so there's also a small version of it. Um, and that was the first step, taking those lambs, making preparations in advance. The second thing was sealing the doors from the angel of death. Take care of them, you take care of this lamb uh, that has to be slaughtered, and, and then you take some of the blood, put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night they are to eat the meat roasted for, over the fire, along with bitter herbs and matzah. So um, I think, I think we've all come to understand that the doors on our house are very important. The, the, the liminal space, the lintels, the going in and out can often be the question of life and death. When I have an, a, a, an order delivered for the soap supermarket, I'm very careful to look through the door, see who the person is, make sure they're wearing a mask, I'm wearing a mask, having them put the stuff down on the floor and not literally come into my house. Those concerns about controlling entrance and exit become very powerful in the same way as the door is so important at this point. Um, and there's a special dress code for the ancient Seder. This is how you should eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, your walking stick in your hand. Eat in chipazon, literally in haste or trembling. It is God's Passover. None of you should go out of the door of your house until morning. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals. I will bring judgment on the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be the sign for you on houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over or protect you. Now, the notion that we have a special dress code, of course, applies to the use of masks and the constant issue in Israel of telling people it doesn't count if the mask covers your mouth and not your nose. There are very specific rules about these things. And in the same way, the original Seder was not a Seder of festivity, but rather a Seder of incredible nervousness and trembling about when can the door, keeping the door closed, and then at the end, opening the door and having the exodus at the right moment, not really knowing what's going to happen. Um, so with that dress code, we also have, of course, the lockdown. You're not allowed to go out of your door. In Israel, we just went through our fourth lockdown in which it was limited. You couldn't be in a house with anybody else who wasn't part of your nuclear family. You couldn't walk more than a kilometer unless, of course, you were hiking and then they would allow that a little bit. Um, and there were fines. And even on Purim, which was after the lockdown, there was a curfew in Purim after 8 p.m. So all kinds of constant controls. The freedom of mobility, which we take so clearly, which of course slaves don't have, and in the 10th plague, they didn't have that freedom of mobility, was all a preparation for freedom, and freedom meant mobility. Now, as you, as you know, a, in the uh, Passover at this time is a home holiday. You're all supposed to stay at home. And you're not allowed to go to the synagogue or, of course, uh, later on to the temple. 
in that sense, it's a little bit reminiscent of something Julie mentioned to me that her synagogue has not had a face-to-face, -face, well, face-to-face -face by Zoom, but not physical face-to-face -face meeting in the synagogue or with people from the synagogue for more than a year. So again, this Seder is unique precisely because you, you're not allowed to have the larger community you normally have. Now the question is, what do we do with that, All right? Well, let me add one other thing, and that is commemorating. In the middle of describing the original Seder in Egypt, suddenly the text has an aside and it says, what's going to happen in the future is that you're gonna to continue to celebrate these same rituals, even when there's no angel of death, even when you're in the land of Israel. And when you do those weird rituals with the matzah and the maror and so on, your children are going to start asking questions. When in future generations, your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them, it's the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over, protected, skipped over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. Now, that whole notion of the children asking questions is of course the key thing that creates the Seder as something that memorializes a, a unique historical event. So uh, just last week, three of my grandchildren were visiting our house, one 12, 10, and eight, and they were sitting around and saying to themselves, you know, this has been a unique year. Most of our school year has been Zoom. We've had all kinds of restrictions. How are we gonna tell our children about this unique historic year of Corona when they're gonna grow up in a totally different world? And they began to imagine what that would be like it may be something interesting to ask at your Seder, what exactly from the Corona experience and from what we have learned from the Corona experience, do we want to convey to the next generation, which may be five years from now, maybe 10 years from now. So my wife, in order to do that process, she, uh, here I'll show you, I'm gonna stop with this one for a second and I will share something else. Let's see if we get this. Uh, this one. Yes. So my wife put together an Israeli version of a Seder Corona, that is a Seder plate. So here she has an ambulance, a toy ambulance, because of the how many people were in the hospital. She has stop signs because there were police blockades to keep people from driving from one city or even from one neighborhood to the next. Many times going into, uh, going into the office, I would be stopped and they would test my temperature to see if I was infected. Here we had a, a fancy mask that we used, a Corona Extra, which is an empty bottle of beer that I found across the street next to the garbage. And of course, Alka Gel, a kind of a, a disinfectant, which one might even use at the Seder instead of washing your hands, do it with Alka Gel. And my wife has a series of puppets, one puppet for each one of the uh, characters in the song Chad Gadya, there was one goat, and this is the symbol of the angel of death which she used. I imagine that the American version would be a little bit different from that. So one of the things I would suggest to you, just as I suggested it to my 12-year-old granddaughter just now, is you might want to put together a list of the plagues for this year. What have been the plagues of Corona? Um, lost jobs, deaths, permanent damage to lungs, a lost year of plans and trips. I just retired and all the trips that I was planning to do were all canceled. And I just heard a very painful lecture about the way in which the plague has struck women more than, any, more than men all over the world in terms of the increase of family violence where the home instead of being a safe haven was a more dangerous one the enormous pressure of women both to work and to take care of the children when they're, never, they're not at school. And for university people, especially like my daughter, who's a, uh, uh, recently appointed to be a teacher, a professor of, uh, not a professor, a lecturer at the university in, uh, in gender studies in the education department, she has lost a whole year of preparing articles that will ultimately, she's gonna be tested on that in terms of her tenure. And there's a clear discrimination between women with children, especially in a family in which the, she's taking care of four younger children and at the same time teaching and doing her work, she's clearly not able to write. So will the universities balance that out or not? 
So all kinds of things that are really unique to the plagues of 2020, 2021. The second thing that I would suggest, you know, let's go back to the Seder planner. Um, the second thing I would say is that it's clear that what Pesach is about, of course, it's a family reunion. Um, and if anything, the mitzvah of social distance, that is keeping ourselves safe by not sharing the table with anybody, by not hugging, by having small seders of one or two people, all of those commandments, the commandment to save your life, have undermined the whole notion of the seder as a time of family reunion. Um, and the fact that you can't even go to the synagogue for a community seder is certainly about that. Now, that denial of social, that, deni that social distancing has also tended to undermine solidarity. So on one hand, well, we're all in this together, and yet the best way for us to save ourselves is to cut ourselves off from other people. And so there's been a tremendous loss on solidarity, sometimes a suspension of close relationships, Although, of course, Zoom has also allowed us to connect up with other people, even in great, at great distances, and sometimes to have a Seder with 20 or 30 people from all over the world who never would have gotten together for a physical Seder. So I'd like to suggest that in response to the way social distance has tended to break down family unity, that there should be two things that we take into account. The first one is that we should make every effort to contact every single person in our family over the next two weeks before Seder, giving them blessings, finding out how they're doing, showing you care. And if, as there always are in family relationships, there are damaged relationships, this is the time to try to heal those relationships one time, one way or another, right? This is a period in which there's a great loneliness and we have a special mitzvah to handle that loneliness, both toward family members, but also towards community members. Let me give you an example from Rabbi Soloveitchik who has a very interesting interpretation of this. Okay. Okay, let's see if we get to this, 16. Okay. So you'll remember at the very beginning of the Seder, there's a part in which we say, this is the bread of poverty and persecution. ha lachma -anya. And they repeat, and in ha lachma -anya, there are two phrases that seem to be repetitious. Both of them say, let everybody come to our Seder. So this is the way Rabbi Soloveitchik has interpreted that. Although they may initially seem redundant, the two invitations we issue in Halach Ma'anya, let all who are hungry enter and eat, and let all who are in need come and celebrate the Passover, in reality are not redundant. The first one refers to whoever is in need of bread, whoever is hungry. The second one means those who are in need but not in need of bread. Kol Ditzrich refers to one who is alone, who has a lot of matzah and wine, but no home or family. There are indeed many ways to be included among the kol ditzrich. The invitation to all who are in need is not to eat with us, rather it's to spend Pesach with us, to celebrate with us. It's an invitation addressed to the unfortunate and lonely people. They might be millionaires. It is completely irrelevant. Whoever is in need should come and celebrate. Ha lach ma'anya is the renewal of a pledge of solidarity. And so if you can try in particular to let your Seder reach out to create solidarity any way you can through telephone calls and Zoom and dropping things off at people's doorsteps, even if you can come into their house, that becomes essential. And at the very end of the Seder, we have the story of Elijah. We open the door, Remember, opening the door is not to be taken for granted. We open the door for Elijah and Elijah is described as the, as the prophet who will come and turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of their children to the parents. And so that mutual effort to heal family, heal distance and heal family fractures, I think is a central part, especially for a Seder at this time, given Corona. Um, I can just give you one example of that. Um, in the, in the city of Rehovot in Israel, where they have the Weizmann Institute, a committee got together during the first lockdown. They 
mapped out the whole of Rehovot. They appointed people to be responsible for each neighborhood. They found somebody in each apartment building to be a, a captain of that apartment building, and then to communicate with everybody in that building and find out what their needs were. Did they need food? Were they in contact with their families? And all of that really created a sense of unity and solidarity and relationship, which we certainly had, wouldn't have had in a regular year of Pesach, even if it would have been an ideal to have such a thing. The third thing I would suggest that's very different about the Seder this year is that we take, we usually take, I usually take freedom and prosperity and physical security for granted. And therefore, the festivity of the holiday, I also take pretty much for granted. It's going to be fun. It's going to be joyous. It's going to be with the family. It'll be fun songs we always like. But now I think, even with the hope of a vaccine, we are careful not to get our hopes up too much, not to dismiss the basic existential anxiety and vulnerability that we have discovered. I don't think we are going to readily rely on our governments again, or even on the medical services, or on the resilience of the economy. And uh, I'm not even sure we're going to, certainly not going to trust our citizens, since many citizens disregarded the health needs of each other. I think we also are even more aware than ever of the unequal and unjust division of vulnerability during Corona and of access to vaccinations as well. So all of these elements make it, make it clear that it's not obvious that this is going to be a holiday in which we're going to feel happy as opposed to depressed or disappointed or pessimistic. And therefore, I think it becomes a special mitzvah to try to work and make yourself happy. Yeah, I'm saying artificially, there's all kinds of ways to cheer people up when they're feeling down. And there's plenty of reasons to feel down. So here, let me show you something in our Corona Seder planner. Okay. This is from the Hasidic Rebbe, Rebbe Nachman of Bratslav, the great grandson of the founder of Hasidism of the Baal Shem Tov. He was definitely a depressive person um, who also died very, very young, I think at the age of 34. Uh, and yet he's famous, despite his own depression, for saying it's really important to try to maintain happiness. He took the notion that the exodus from Egypt, liberation, occurs in every human being, in every era, in every year, and even on every day. That is the experience of going out of slavery, out of restriction, out of constriction to a wider world, a freer world, is really an experience we have to do over and over again because we're constantly falling back into these situations in which we're enslaved or in which we're constricted. And therefore, um, he, said, he said the following. He said, Rabbi Nachman holds that an intentional, even artificial effort to generate joy is the source of true freedom. While dwelling on sadness may sink us into marash chora, dark depression. Famously in the Warsaw Ghetto, followers of Reb Nachman sang and danced about the mitzvah to be joyful, even in a terrible situation. Not because they were naively hopeful or passive, but because they wanted to fight off despair and they refused to let the Nazis terrorize them. His claim is that freedom and joy are connected. When you don't feel joy, when you're depressed, when you're worried, when you're pessimistic, you suddenly lose the desire to act. You're frightful, you're, you're withdraw into yourselves. And therefore, artificially, if necessary, we should create a sense of festivity in order to get people to feel more joy. And then that will have a positive influence on what's happening around them generally. So how might we do that? Let me suggest a particular part of the Seder that might be useful for that. Okay. And it is Dayenu, right? Which means it's enough. Here is a list of all kinds of things that happened to the Jews in Egypt. They, if we had been, if there'd been 10 plagues and we'd gotten out of Egypt, that would have been enough. If we'd crossed the Red Sea, that would have been enough. If we'd received manna in the desert, that would have been enough. If we had gotten to the land of Israel, that would have been enough. In other words, in order to overcome the pessimism, instead of looking at what we're missing 
what's the difference between 2019 and 2021? Basically, dayenu is the ability to appreciate the partial and not to judge by how far we are from what normality used to look like or what our hopes are. And I would imagine that you could ask someone to put together people coming to your Seder, a list of three or four or five things that they are thankful for at the end of this year of Corona. For me, definitely Zoom would be at the top of the list as something that I am very thankful for. But I would also say that I'm very thankful for my, my, grand, my children and grandchildren who were so caring about me that they didn't wanna visit us until after we had our vaccinations. I think that, that notion, the, the need for gratefulness, as Abraham Joshua Heschel calls, that could be a key element in our seders. Any comments or questions at this point before we go on? And if there are any uh, folks who want to ask a question, you can either find the raise hand, virtual raise hand button, um, or you can put your question in the chat and we will address them. And if you can't find the virtual hand button, you can let us know in the chat that you have a question and we'll get you unmuted. I'll read a comment um, from the chat box as folks are thinking about their question. This is from Laura. We streamlined um, the time last year and will again this year because of different attention spans on screen versus in person. And um, we met the challenge in part by stripping away much of the formulaic Seder with enough symbols to still to make it a Seder while focusing on group connection and conversation. Very nice. Good piece of advice. The uh, Laura. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. I am curious about one element and how either you know them or others have dealt with it on Zoom. Um, Zoom has, is notoriously bad for sound reverb. Yes. So like last year, our compromise between people want to sing and it's going to sound awful is just, we sang a couple of songs and we kept it short and we largely cut out the singing, but we didn't want to make it zero. And I'm wondering if there were, are just other good strategies that people have used. I imagine off the top of my head, I would say the first thing would be to ask one person to do the singing and have everybody else sing along, but with mute and then switch to another person. So if you have a song like Chad Gadya, which has many, uh, many stanzas, then you could have each time a different person doing a stanza. And one of the things that I was gonna talk about next time, but I'll mention it today, is we have stuffed animals. That This is for the goat. And we also have a stuffed animal for the cow. And then we have each person sing their part and also make the sounds that go with that animal, a kind of old McDonald had the farm. But if we have only one person singing at a time and the other people singing, but in mute, then you won't have the feedback problem. At least I don't think so. I'm no high tech person, that's for sure. Yeah, that, that's right. That's a good suggestion, Noam. Um, we have a question from Healy. How, how can we connect the Manishtana to coronavirus? Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's probably the simplest thing in the world because we just basically did it. You say, how is this Seder different than the Seder we had two years ago? Just to ask that question and then to go through other things. What, how is your year this year different than your year uh, two years ago? So, or another one is, how have I changed Manishtana? How have I changed or my family dynamics have changed from what it was two years ago to the way it is now? In other words, try to make the questions, not only the technical questions like, why do we dip twice, but real questions about the sense of distance and difference. That is the most authentic thing to do because that's what it was in the original Seder in Egypt. They, they, they live their lives in the light of the angel of death and plague outside their door. And then the children a generation later would say, why are you doing these things? And the gap between one historical period and another actually makes us much, much more aware of unique things. 
That's a great question. And next time we'll have a lot more to say about other ideas for asking questions not tied to Corona. Great. Um, Elaine says, now we're, we are vaccinated, but we're still on Zoom with our adult children. How do we make the Seder better when we want to be together? Look, uh, I think I'm gonna, next time I'm gonna deal with all kinds of practical issues. And I think many of the same techniques that we use during any Seder are gonna also be true for this Seder. Each time you have to customize them. In our family last year, we had a Seder that lasted six hours. We thought it would last an hour, it was six hours. It was my wife and I on one Zoom and my uh, daughter and son-in-law and their three children on the other Zoom. And it, was, it, it went beautifully and we, re we were able to interact, especially because it was only two. So if you actually have a Seder with only two sites, it's a lot easier to have interactions. And of course, one of the things I was very happy with, I didn't have very many dishes to do at the end of it. Okay, there are a couple more comments here in the chat box. Just... Um, Last year, Barbara says, last year, we of course made the comparison between the year before and last year, right? Um, what I particularly like is the formulaic inclusion of COVID throughout the Seder. It will be vital for the future as we look back um, onto this year. Right, great. Um, Nancy says, maybe also come up with a list of 10 blessings, um, a 10, 10 blessings list as a response to the 10 plagues. Um, right. Top of the list I already mentioned Zoom, the blessing of technology that has kept us connected. Can we even begin to imagine what the past year would have been like um, without it? Very nice. Um, Susan asks, uh, how, how do we handle the, how to handle the fact that my mom's first yurt site is the day after the second Seder? I don't know if that's a technical question or a... Well, this is a, it's a wonderful question. And I think it, it, and it can be broadened, not only to be for a yurt site. At any Seder, there are people who are missing whether, God forbid, if it was because of a death of corona or whether it was simply because they passed away five or 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. And therefore, a, a way to open your Seder is to go around and ask people, who is missing from our Seder that you would like to be here, whether an imaginary character, a historic character, or of course, a family member. And if in the case of your mother, uh, may, her, may she rest in peace for the Yort site, it would be a question of, if you sort of uh, think about this metaphorically, sitting her in a chair and then having everybody in the family ask questions about her, especially the younger people, and then say, and then have other people answer and say, well, no, what did, what did she do when she was young? Well, somebody can answer that. What, what did she do for a living? When did she come to America? What was her favorite dish for Passover? You can try to create a picture in which you bring her alive and commemorate her. Maybe you're gonna have a private Seder plate. There's an idea I often suggest is that you have a Seder plate of family souvenirs or heirlooms, and then each heirloom you pick it up and say, just like we say, what does the matzah mean? We say, what does this soup ladle mean? What does this, uh, what does this passport mean? What does this picture mean? So perhaps you could have souvenirs from your mother that are on that particular plate, and then raise each one of them and say, does this remind anybody of anything? And then tell those stories. That's what I would suggest for, for whoever is mis missing from the Seder. That's beautiful. Um, we have a question from B. Maya. Do you have a particular advice to someone hosting their very first Seder? Uh -huh. Okay. Let me take that one up next time. Next week. Okay. Julie, you'll be responsible for making sure to ask that question again. Okay. Will do. Um, and then a couple of questions about making the Seder more inclusive, um, whether because whether make, maybe changing it to four daughters, changing the four sons to four daughters, um, including LGBTQ people. Um, what about being the only Jew in, um, in the family? Very good. Let's make that all for next time, because then I want to talk about the practical things. I'd like now to move to a larger historical background and talk about what the rabbis had in mind for the ideal Seder leader 
And then by getting a historical perspective, then maybe you'll feel empowered also to do the customizing and changing that some of your questions already reflected. It, I mean, I, I don't have any objection to people changing things of the Seder, but the first thing is, let's try to understand where it's coming from, what the ideal of the rabbinic Seder was, and then we'll decide what we wanna do in relationship to those ideals in this particular Seder. So I'm gonna share with you another document. Um, I hope this is, yes, this is the one. Okay, the guide to the perplexed Seder leader. Um, in fact, let me even ask you a chat question. Julie, maybe you could type this in. Who for you would be the ideal Seder leader? And then I'll give you a multiple choice. Would your ideal Seder leader, if you could have it, be a teacher, an actor, a historian of ancient Egypt, a rabbi, or perhaps a grandparent? Who's your ideal, if you had to pick one? The historian, the rabbi, the actor, the teacher, the grandparent. We could actually do a poll if you were interested. Go to it. Okay. It's a little, it's a little, being a little slow. So, sorry, we'll have to keep it in the chat. Okay or you can set up the poll and people can do it while we're gonna go on, okay? Sounds good. Because that's the question that should be in the back of your mind as we, we take a look at this. Um, so. Okay, come on. Okay, so we're gonna take a look for a moment at, now notice my question, why is the Seder leader perplexed? I think that Seder leaders are very often perplexed and that's, that's in, endemic to the Seder, precisely because they have so many things to balance. Each person who comes to their Seder has different expectations based on where they grew up, what their backgrounds are, moving from people who are Jewish and non-Jewish, people who are religious and non-religious, people who are more recently becoming more religious or more halachic between young and old, people with different, uh, different um ability to wait and how hungry they are. And the Seder leader, if he tries to please everyone, is often in a very difficult situation. And so that's why I think Seder leaders by nature are perplexed until they make a decision, what is the most important thing for them of the Seder? And then they can be empowered and liberated, perhaps from as some person already gave as an example from some of the formulaic texts they want to they want to drop in order to make more room for other kinds of activities. I think once the Seder leader has a clear idea of what they want, then we have all kinds of methods for trying to achieve that. So to understand that the Seder leader's role, we have to go and take a moment to look at five stages in the evolution of the Seder. The first one we discussed before, Passover in Egypt on the night of the 10th plague of the firstborn, 12,000, 1200 BCE. It's a home holiday. But when the Jews move to Israel and when Solomon builds the first temple and afterwards that temple is made the only place where you're allowed to have sacrifices, suddenly no one could have a Seder at home. Every Seder had to be in the temple. I don't mean a synagogue a community Seder, but I mean a, a pilgrimage holiday to Jerusalem and for the sacrifice of the Paschal Lamb in the temple in which the priesthood would be there to take care of the sacrifice. After they roasted the meal, the food, they would hand it back to people and they would go and have a barbecue picnic what's called in Israel a mongol on the hills of the Mount of Olives and the uh, uh, Mount of Olives and Mount Scopus. Um, and that was their holiday. It was a holiday that was always going on a trip. It was never at home in any kind of a way. At the same time as the priests are organizing the sacrifice, the, the, the Levi'im, I happen to be a Levi, I don't know if there's anybody else from the tribe of Levi here, and at least we're supposed to be the musicians, the people who wrote psalms, the people who were the musicians who played musical instruments. So you have the Temple Philharmonic, 
along with the temple priesthood dressed in white, who are responsible for the whole of the ritual of the temple. And for those of you who belong to temples, Temples, especially big temples, synagogues that have that remind us a little bit of the ancient temple, and in which you have a rabbi. Sometimes, when I grew up, my father was always dressed in a long robe, making him look like a Protestant minister. There's a sense in which the synagogue, the modern synagogue, came to imitate the ancient temple, and everything was handed over to the professional Jew to run the event. However, when the temple, the second temple, was destroyed by the Romans in the year 70, and the rabbis had to reorganize Judaism without a temple, then in their first law book, the Mishnah, the oral law book, the Mishnah, in a little town called Yavne, since Jerusalem was completely destroyed, uh, the rabbi Rabban Gamliel got together and he created the protocol for the first Seder. In fact, the word Seder is invented at this time. Seder means order, as you probably know, but it's more specifically the order of worship. Because the Seder the rabbis imagined involved an imitation of the order of the worship that was in the temple when there was a sacrifice, even though there is no sacrifice after the destruction of the temple. And we're going to take a look at the way the rabbis imagined handing over the responsibility for Passover which was once in the hands of the professional priest and, um, and levy and handing it over to the head of the household as it became a household ritual again, what it hadn't been for more than 1,200 years. Then, in, at this point, by the way, there is no Haggadah. There's no Haggadah at all. In fact, in the development of the Seder, if we go back to the time of the Passover in the temple, the Jews having their picnic on the hilltop, they did not have four cups of wine. They did not ask four questions. They didn't have a book called the Haggadah. They didn't recline on pillows. None of those things belonged to the picnic that they had after the temple sacrifice. But when the rabbis created the Seder, they introduced all those elements, four cups of wine, everybody has to recline. In fact, I decided to put a pillow behind me for this occasion, plus sitting and teaching in a chair for so long hurts my back. And everybody should have a nice pillow at their Seder, I think. Um, and also maybe with even with a nice cover, if you're good at tie dyeing or something to make it a Passover, a Passover themed pillow. Um, and, but at this time, there's no book called the Haggadah. The first Haggadah belongs to the Passover of exile. That is the Passover that happened in Babylonia in the 9th and 10th century. This was a period in which 90% of the Jewish world were Jews living in Muslim countries that went from Spain all the way to, uh, all the way to India. And the central political and economic authority was in Baghdad. And that's also where the rabbis were, who were the rabbis who headed the major yeshivot and the head of the, ex the Jews of the exile. And so there they could centralize Judaism. And there they established the first prayer books. There were no prayer books before. There were prayers, but not a book. And they also established the first Haggadah, which is like the word Sidur is the order of prayer. The Seder is the order of the Passover liturgy. Um, and of course, most people didn't have a Haggadah because it was expensive to produce a Haggadah, but the Haggadah existed, and perhaps at least the head of the family would have one. When we take an enormous jump, a thousand years, to the modern Passover Seder, we can see that we're in the middle of a period of paradigm shift. And I don't know which way it's going to go, but the modern Passover Seder begins with the fact that people do not know Hebrew, not that they knew Hebrew before they didn't. Maybe the head of the household knew how to read Hebrew, that doesn't make him a great scholar. And certainly the children and the, the women at the family Seder did not know Hebrew. So we have a massive transformation in which everybody gets a copy of the Haggadah, mass, mass, and everybody has literacy, including of course, the women who can read English and therefore can read parts of the Seder let alone the situations where women finally get a decent Jewish education and they can read Hebrew as well. 
And that becomes a period in which we're looking for different kinds of Haggadot. So let me jump ahead for a moment. Let's see if I did this right. Yes. If you think about in, in North America, sort of a, thumb, a thumbnail history of three great American satyrs and beyond. I would say the first satyr in America that is the satyr of the beginning of the 20th century is the Zaidi satyr. I'm using the Ashkenazi word for grandfather because most of the Jews coming to America were Ashkenazim coming from Russia, Poland, Lithuania. Generally, the Zaidi Seder with the immigrant involved, as some of you may vaguely remember, it involved the grandfather or the uncle reading through the whole Seder, all in Hebrew at an incredibly quick pace. Without that grandfather, really, he wasn't scholarly. He was, his major concern was not Jewish education, but supporting the family and sending money back to his relatives to bring them to America. But he wanted to do the Seder right, and that meant reading the whole thing. For those of us who didn't understand his Hebrew, and I think I wouldn't understand his Hebrew either because of his accent and the speed they're reading, and we were, we were very bored and we thought of that Seder as being very, very long, waiting for the four questions, waiting for the afikoman, waiting of course for the food, but it wasn't really a participatory Seder, that's for sure. Now, the great revolution came, let's pick a date, 1923, with Maxwell House, which is not a Jewish owned coffee company. How many of you by raising your hand have, uh, have a Maxwell House or a Manischewitz or a Margaretin Haggadah? How much do they cost? Right, unfair competition for me, who's a producer of Haggadah, they were free. And the man who convinced Maxwell House you may know this story, to produce the Haggadah and to distribute it free, was a, a Jewish uh, um, advertising man from Brooklyn. And he said that Ashkenazi Jews are very strict. Not only don't they have leavened bread, but they also don't eat beans. And they're not sure whether coffee beans are forbidden or not. But he says, I know a rabbi who will tell us that coffee beans are perfectly okay. So if you produce a Haggadah and on every other page is an advertisement for, uh, for the coffee and there's a Heksher given by some rabbi, then people, Jews, who are just up and coming within society will fall in love with Maxwell House coffee. In fact, historically, up until recently, Jews in America preferred Maxwell House coffee two to one above any other demographic group. So maybe it really worked. However, by translating the Haggadah into English, that didn't solve the problem. Why? Because the Haggadah wasn't translated into English that we understand. It was in, translated into the, uh, into the English of, thou hast vouchsafed unto us, Un, uh, eternal salvation. Now, if you think in 1923 that that's the way people in America thought, spoke, it certainly wasn't. So you were translating the Haggadah from Hebrew, which is relatively simple, into an English which is from the King James Bible in order to make it sound like something pious according to the standards of the Protestants who dominated America, the wasps of that period. And the truth is, even if you translate the Haggadah, it's a pretty boring book. And yet people say, aha, now, now, thank God, we have participation. You read, you read, you read, going around the table. However, and some parts we do in Hebrew and in English, the result was a couple of things. The first thing is that the Seder became three times as long as it used to be. Zaidi read fast. When you read Hebrew and English and everybody takes a turn, it's going to take three times as long without being three times as interesting. And each person is gonna focus on their performance anxiety to make sure they read it properly because everybody else at the table will be correcting their English as well as their Hebrew because of course we have to save them from the shame of not knowing how to read English properly. And therefore, the reading, the public reading, the public recitation of the Haggadah was hardly what I would call participation and maximizing participation. In the 70s, the Jewish catalog, which was the Jewish version of the whole earth catalog, 
emphasized the notion of do-it-yourself Judaism and do-it-yourself seders. And they had lots of creative, non-halachic ideas for how to, you would dress up and you would write and create your own Haggadah with mimeograph, if you remember that ancient form of reproduction. There were also a whole series of political Haggadot that came out, a women's Haggadah, a vegetarian Haggadah called, if I, may, if I remember, the, 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 the Feast of the Lamb. Um, and you had, uh, you had feminist Haggadot of various kinds. You had the Freedom Seder by Arthur Waskow, which when I brought it home drove my father crazy, especially when it quoted, Rabbi Eldridge Cleaver teaches us, for those of you who remember the uh, Black Panther. Um, but it wasn't easy to take this model of a do-it-yourself Seder and to give it to large groups of the community because it takes a lot of work and a lot of initiative. And most people don't have the time or the ability to do that. Politically, political Haggadot don't have the problem that at a family where people have multiple political views, certainly the case in America today, then you're asking for political fights if you bring in a Haggadah, which is over, overtly either blue or red or whatever it might be, feminist or progressive or whatever it might be. And therefore, one of the attempts beginning in 1997 that we had was to create a Haggadah which offers you a pluralist Seder. In other words, instead of whatever Haggadah you pick determines what your Seder is, we brought a Haggadah that had all the traditional elements in it and many, many ideas and readings and activities that you could use at your Seder without ever wanting people to read it from cover to cover. That's impossible unless you have eight days of nonstop reading. We wanted it to be an active Seder. We wanted people to customize the Seder, making it longer or shorter, more traditional or less traditional. We wanted them to maximize participation and therefore, that's the paradigm that I've been selling for the last, uh, since 1997, I guess the last uh, uh, 24 years, in order to encourage people to use the Haggadah as a resource, as a how-to guide, in order to create their own seders that fit their values, their needs, and specifically the people who are going to be at their seder that year. Anyway, we'll get back to that. Let's go back to the history lesson for a moment. And here you see, uh, we've gone through the five stages very quickly. We took a look at the first Haggadah and then at the attempts to create multiple modern forms of Haggadah. And now I want to take a look at this. What was the rabbi's ideal of the Seder? And in particular, what was their ideal of who the Seder leader should be? So I'm going to skip this and go to the three concepts of the rabbinic seder and its leader. Are you missing a of? Always, always typos. Okay, so let's start in the following way. I wonder what you answer to that warm-up question about who you thought the ideal seder leader would be. Is it a parent? If it's not a parent, or if it is a parent, is it the parent who's a teacher? The parent who is a historian? The parent who has halachic knowledge, who's let's say a rabbi or something like that, or a cantor? the rabbi or the leader of the Seder is a, a teacher, educator, or an actor. Now I ask that question because when the rabbis um, conceptualized the Seder and determined its protocol, they also used three different roles for the non-rabbi, that's what we're talking about, the non-rabbi who's running the Seder, the non-priest non-rabbi. And the first model was they needed somebody to be the ritual director or the master of ceremonies with an emphasis on ceremonies. They wanted somebody who, like a temple priest, like a synagogue rabbi in the modern synagogue rabbis, or like a chief of protocol at a diplomatic dinner, who would make sure that you get through all the most important things. Now, I don't know how, I mean, I know there are plenty of seders in which people are worried. May I know my uncle is going to leave the seder immediately after the meal. He's not going to stay for Elijah's cup or for any of the songs at the ending. I better hurry up. Or I remember my father's problem is that my mother set the timer on the brisket for 9.30. And at 9.30, she was nudging my father, hurry up. The brisket's going to burn. 
So the need to plan your timing is a very important one if you want to get in all the major rituals which are part of the night. What would a Seder be if you never got to the Afikoman? What happens if you're supposed to have four cups and in fact you've grown up in a Seder that they never got to the third and fourth cup, etc., etc. That's the first role. The name of this evening, according to this role, is the Pesach Seder. Because Seder means order, as I said, the ritual order of the Pesach sacrifice. It's also, however, there's another protocol of the rabbinic Seder, and that's the protocol of the Greek-style symposium. That is, a meal that has wine, four cups of wine, according to the rabbis, and of course has its various foods that you have to eat. So that's all part of the order of the Seder. And there you want a person with a stopwatch. You want a person who's going to say, no, no time for discussion now. No time for acting things out. Let's concentrate and get through the Seder. Many people mistakenly call the Seder the Haggadah, and they call the food the food. When is the Seder going to be over so we can eat? But of course, the whole notion of the Seder is that it's around the table and around a common meal that you're eating together. It's the sharing of the matzah, of the maror, and of, well, maybe lamb chops or any other, or brisket. That actually is what the Seder is about. It wraps, literally wraps the food around with explanations, stories, and songs. Now, the second role of the Seder leader is to run a talk show. What am I talking about? When the rabbis would sit down at the table on any Shabbat, not just on Passover, they would recline on pillows, just as the Greeks would recline on couches, so they would be on couches. They would be discussing various verses from the Torah reading, from Parshat HaShavua, and they would do Midrashim, their own interpretations. They would be having an intellectual symposium while noshing, drashing, and drinking wine. That's exactly what they did, just like the Greeks did, but with a different content. And therefore, if we want, as the rabbis did, for there to be an intellectual discussion of the values of freedom and slavery, of poverty and helping one another at our Seder, then we need somebody who knows how to be a talk show moderator. Think for a moment. Think of the best talk show host you can think of. Think about what their skills are. Right? One skill is that they don't talk too much. If you have a symposium in the style of a university symposium with three people giving long talks and then five minutes for questions at the end, that's not the Seder model. The Greek symposium and the Greek and the, the symposium style rabbinic Seder is about somebody who knows how to get many people involved in the discussion by asking questions, by being provocative, by focusing the conversation. Now, the ritual director, Seder leader, is not so pleased with the talk show host because his conversations can go on and on, like the five rabbis who went on and on all night long telling stories and giving interpretations. So there's a tension between the two. The talk show host mod moderator is, of course, focusing on teenagers and adults because it's an intellectual exchange, not the children. In fact, the word agada or hagada means in Aramaic, it means rabbinic discussion or symposium on the Exodus in the Torah. And that may be one reason the book is called the Haggadah, meaning a collection of rabbinic interpretations or midrashim on the verses about the Exodus in the Torah. The third role the rabbis wanted was the parent educator. Of course, that's an idea that goes back to the Bible. When the kids ask questions, the parent is supposed to explain, tell the story. Here we need the skills of somebody doing homeschooling. Do you have anybody at your Seder this year who is involved in homeschooling? Or at least somebody who's an educator who could take over part of the role of being the expert educator at your Seder? And here we have another meaning of the word Haggadah, not Haggadah in Aramaic, as in Midrash Agadah, but Haggadah as in Hebrew, to tell a story. You shall tell your children a story, an intergenerational story. Notice, 
if the most important people at your Seder are your children or grandchildren, then you have to aim your Seder as a parent educator. If the most important people are the people who are teenagers and above, then you want the talk show host. If, however, you want to make sure that we get through all the rituals and so it has the shape of a Seder, then we're going to be more interested in, I don't know, loyalty to our grandfather or to our notion of what Judaism demands of us. This is a tension. There's a true perplexity as to which one of these three to emphasize. I think that every Seder needs to have a little bit of all three, but you have to decide what's the most important of those and give that priority. So I'm going to skip over the Mishnah in this case, and I'm seeing if I can develop these three a little bit in greater depth. So the first thing is the priestly master of ceremonies who maintains the traditional protocol. Therefore, at the beginning of the Seder is a poem, a medieval poem written in France in the 12th century, which goes like this, at least this is how I sing it. Kadesh, Urchatz, Karpas, Yachatz. Recite the Kiddush, wash the hands, eat the green vegetables, break the middle matzah, etc., etc. Notice, this is not a table of contents. It's not about the themes of the Seder. It's about the activities, the ritualized activities. In fact, it's not even a listing of all of the ritual activities, but it suggests that central to the Seder is a whole series of behavioral activities that we're involved with. And those behaviors and those symbols then have to be explained as Rabban Gamliel said, anyone who has not said these three things on Pesach has not fulfilled his obligation. And these are them the Pesach Seder, Matzah, and Maror. By the way, we already have an early example of that in the Last Supper in the New Testament, in which Jesus says, holding a cup of wine, this is the cup of covenant, this is my blood. And then he takes the broken piece of matzah and he says, and this is my body, from which we get the term hook est corpus, or sometimes turned into hocus pocus as in when the matzah suddenly becomes the body of Christ. If you see that magically, you can see how hoc est corpus could be misinterpreted as hocus pocus. Whatever, there's these rituals. Now, besides the rituals, which by the way, involve time limits and also having certain amounts of each thing, we have the symposium seder. To get the point of the symposium seder, let me suggest that we think for a moment, that um, if we think for a moment about what the original Greek symposia was about, our best example of that is the one from Plato around 450 BCE, in which the conversation is, what is the meaning of love? It's a question that anybody could respond to, and he brings five or six different answers to that question. Uh, and it's the asking of the question, the evoking of conversation, which is the central part of the symposium. If we ask the question, in what way are we still enslaved? Or what, it, what did I learn from Corona about the real meaning of freedom for myself, like freedom of mobility, then we're beginning to ask a question that could generate a symposium that everybody's involved with. Now, when the Greeks were conquered by the Romans in the Roman, in the Roman Empire, which is the period when the rabbis are also part of the Roman Empire and they're putting together the new model of the Seder, then we know that the Romans thought it was the height of fad to have a Greek-style symposium in their fancy houses. Now we're talking about upper-class Romans imitating upper-class Greeks. This is not a popular and this is popular, but only for those classes. You have a beautiful house. Uh, 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 and in this beautiful house, you have a big room that has lots of couches for people to meet. And you want to know, how do I imitate the Greek? I don't know if any of you have done sushi parties, or you can have a Thai dinner. We're, we're really into imitating the foods of different kinds of places. And in this case, it was the Greek thing. So a man named Athenius, good name from Athens, a Greek, he wrote a book, in fact, he wrote 12 volumes on how to organize your own home symposia in Rome. 11 of those volumes, I'm told, I never read them, are recipes. 
because we know the people who are most concerned about having guests over is I better get them good food. But one volume was about how to lead a conversation. And this is how he described it. The leader of the symposium took pride in gathering about him many persons of culture and entertaining them with conversation. Now proposing topics worthy of inquiry. Now disclosing solutions of his own. For he never put his questions without previous study or in a haphazard way, but with the utmost critical, even Socratic acumen, so that all admired the keen observation showed by his question. One of the people asked previously, how can we shape the four questions to be related to Corona? Well, here you have to think about it a lot. What question will evoke the most interesting responses that maximizes participation? Cicero in Rome writes, the one who engages in conversation should not bar others from participating in it as if he were entering upon a private monopoly. But in general conversation, he should think it, but in general conversation, he should think it not unfair for each to have his turn. Questions should be easy, the problems plain and familiar, not intricate and dark so that they may never vex the unlearned nor frighten them from speaking up. The discourse should be like our wine, common to all of which everyone may equally partake. Now that's an issue for many of us at the Seder, that there's a small number of people who really are into the Seder and know all the customs. They may be kids coming from day schools <clears throat> or maybe somebody who's recently become Orthodox and they have so much to tell about the Seder, but they're speaking a private language that most people don't really understand especially if they're quoting their, their yeshiva rabbis about things. And Cicero warns us we have to make sure that the conversation allows access to everybody. I don't mean dumbing it down. I mean asking a question to which everybody can have access and not only the people who are already in the know and who want to show off what they already know. And Plutarch adds, a symposium is a communion of serious and mirthful entertainment. You remember I said that the Seder leader is similar to a talk show host. The talk show host, how do they begin? They begin by telling jokes. They have to lighten up the atmosphere. And so in a symposium, a Greek symposium, in a Roman, there would be entertainment, there would be singing, there would be activities, and then there would be discourse. And the discourse would be around symbolic actions like the matzah and maror. It furthers a deeper insight into the points debated at the table. For, says Plutarch, the memory of the pleasures arousing from the food is short-lived. But the subjects of philosophical queries and discussions remain always fresh after they have been imparted, at least if you have a philosophic family. Here we have the rabbis of the Seder who went on for all night long telling their story. And a beautiful description, I think, of the way Jews are really good at arguing is Philip Roth in the Operation Shylock. He says, why couldn't the Jews be one people? Why must Jews be in conflict with one another? Why must they be in conflict with themselves? Because divisiveness is not just between Jew and Jew. It's within the individual Jew. Is there a more manifold personality in all the world? I don't say divided. <laughs> divided is nothing. But inside every Jew, every Jew, there's a mob of Jews. The good Jew, the bad Jew, the new Jew, the old Jew, the lover of Jews, the hater of Jews, the friend of the goy, the enemy of the goy, the arrogant Jew, the wounded Jew, the pious Jew, the rascal Jew, the coarse Jew, the gentle Jew, the defiant Jew, the appeasing Jew, the Jewish Jew, the de Jew Jew. Shall I go on? So I have to expound upon the Jew as a 3,000 year amassment of mirrored fragments. Is it any wonder that a Jew is always disputing? He is a dispute, incarnate. So what the rabbis wanted to do in the symposium is they wanted the pluralism of people arguing. Now we all know that there's a certain kind of political arguing which ends up by tearing the whole family apart. 
but we ought to be able to find a way to talk about things and to listen to each other that allows us to disagree, even radically, and yet make it a safe space for those conversations. Don't run away from the discussion, even though you want to set the ground rules for what's allowed and what's not allowed. For example, no personal attacks, no unfriending of somebody else at the Seder because they voted a way that you think is unconscionable. And last but not least, something we're going to spend a lot more time on next week, the leader of the Seder is a parent educator. There are three roles the rabbis wanted from the Seder leader as an educator. To tell the story, to arouse questions, not just to sing the four questions, but arouse questions, and to conduct an intergenerational dialogue. All of those three things are important. Notice, from this perspective, the relationship to the children and grandchildren is the most important thing at the Seder. It's more important than family peace, more important than your parents or your grandparents, certainly more important than your uncle or your aunt. This is the key for bringing people together, bringing generations together. And if you put that, keep that in the center of your concerns, especially after Corona in which many parents and grandparents and children and grandchildren have been separated, then I think that that's a, a proper uh, assessment of what's the most important thing at the Seder. And let me just talk a little bit about the very first of those things, which is, and here, of course, it helps to have props when you're storytelling. In Israel, they sell these not for Passover, they sell them for Purim when everybody gets dressed up. And so we buy lots of them always on Purim, imported of course from China. So a storytelling Seder, you shall tell your children not read the Haggadah. Notice, reading from the book is the enemy of the oral telling of the story. And therefore, the concern for limiting some of the parts of the Seder that you don't read out loud in order to be able to do more oral activities, as somebody reminded us they did last year, that's essential, I think, to every Seder. I'm not anti-traditional. I like tradition. But tradition you have to use to achieve its purposes. And the purposes are symposium discussion, our rituals, and also our storytelling. So in the Haggadah itself, Haggadah being a kind of a leader's guide or a pedagogic guide for the person leading the Seder, they try to answer questions that Seder leaders often ask, such as, if God had not taken our ancestors out of Egypt, then we would still be enslaved to Pharaoh in Egypt. What's the question they're answering? Why do we have to do this every year? Who cares? It happened 3,200 years ago. So we need to be able to answer that question. But we also have to answer the question, if all of us are wise and all of us are discerning and all of us have seen the Prince of Egypt, why do we have to tell the story again? Well, your Seder has to answer that question. And the answer will be that we want to get people to identify emotionally and ethically with the story, not just to know facts. And therefore the commandment is, the more and the longer one expands and embellishes the story, the more commendable. The key thing is to tell the story and expand on it, even if it goes on all night long like the five rabbis of B'nai Brak. So we're going to talk about this a lot more. Let me just read one text that I love, which I think captures the notion of family intergenerational storytelling from my not my hometown, but the town where I grew up, which is Minneapolis from Garrison Keillor. You may have read some of his, his uh, fiction, not fictionalized books about his family. Let's hear it for Lake Wobegon. And he says, when I was a boy, the storyteller in our family was Uncle Lou, who died a couple of years ago at 93. In a family that intended to be, with, that tended to be withdrawn, Uncle Lou was the friendliest. He had been a salesman and he liked to drive around and drop in on people. He would ask us kids how we were doing in school. And then there was a point in which he would launch in and start telling stories about the family generation upon generation. My parents would be in the living room and we would be eating popcorn. As it got later, I remember lying on the floor so my mother wouldn't see me and send me to bed. 
I just wanted him to tell more and more. I wanted to know everything, what it looked like, what it smelled like, what they ate, what they wore. Doesn't that sound like the Haggadah describing the Jews in Egypt, eating matzah and maror? As I got older, I looked to those stories about family as giving us some sense of place, that in some way we were meant to be here and had a history that we had a standing. Comments, questions? I know it's been long, it's an hour and a half. We're almost done for anybody who can still hang, hang out for a little longer with a few questions, but not too many. I think these hands are from before when you asked um, a question. Okay. So let's see. If, if anyone has a question, you can put it in the chat box or use the raise hand function. We have time for a couple of questions and, and also next time we'll be focusing on like some of the more, some of the practical uh, aspects, some of the questions that we had from before that we will look at next time. Um, make, make sure you do your homework. You do have homework. Right? What's our yeah. homework, Noam? The homework is to take a look and browse through either one of the Haggadot that we've shared with you, the PDF Haggadot for family participation or for Night to Remember. You may want to use the Seder planners we sent in order to begin to decide what's most important at this Seder that we're going to be having. And then in responding to your practical questions, the next time there should be a meeting of the minds between what you want and what you need to do with your families and the resources in these Haggadot. Great. Okay, there is a question from Christopher. Oh, um, sorry. Hi. I'm um, I'm really new to all this, and um, I uh, really appreciate um, this Zoom meeting because otherwise I would have no idea what was going really going on. <laughs> um, and I, I just uh, I had a I, have, I had a question about the seder. Well, in 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 Hebrew that means like a host, right? It means order, as in the order. ritual order of the evening. Okay. Uh, that's really the only question I have now. I'm just going to listen and, and keep learning. <laughs> Great. And definitely look at the Seder planner. See if that helps you to pick what you really want to do. Okay. Yeah. Good luck with your first Seder, Shechiano. That's a wonderful pleasure to have a, your first Seder or one of your first Seders. Great.